Gresham College presents Innovation in the Social Sciences by Professor Sir Roderick Flood, FBA. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my main usual task is to um, introduce speakers on these occasions, but tonight I'm going to inflict myself on you um, and talk about the topic of innovation in the social sciences. Um, I'm going to use in a bit the example of my own discipline, which is economic history. But I want to begin by putting the topic of innovation into the wider social and economic context. Um, because innovation has become an, a very important buzzword uh, in the context of the Depression, because in which innovation is seen as the central uh, means of economic growth, of promoting economic growth, and thus of escaping from the uh, economic depression. So the topic of innovation is much discussed, or much mentioned at any rate, but seems to me to need um, some analysis, and that's the intention of this lecture. Um, just to show you how central the topic of innovation is to uh, certainly research policy, but I think much more generally to economic policy, um, five months ago two important documents were published and together they will determine the whole expenditure by governments across Europe on scientific research uh, over the the course of the next decade. The first of these documents was the so-called Proposals for Horizon 2020, the European Commission's proposals for an investment of 80 billion euros between 2014 and 2020. And that's currently being discussed with the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers. It's not clear whether 80 billion will be the outcome, but it's certainly we're talking about significant numbers of tens of billions of euros devoted principally to boosting innovation um, and with it research. The second document that was published was our government's strategy for research with the word innovation right up front the strategy being for annual expenditure of more than five billion pounds, uh, again, over the course of the next five or six years. So as you can see from these quotations, in both these documents and many more, innovation is the name of the game. Innovation is to be the solution of Britain's and Europe's economic problems in the short and medium term. It's the justification as well for expenditure on research in universities, research institutes, and for the support of small and indeed large firms who are thought to be innovative. Now, few social scientists would dispute the view that, that innovation has, particularly during the last three centuries, been an essential component of economic growth and societal change. But the history of innovation and the history of the study of innovation should lead us, I think, to question whether achieving innovation is as simple a process as governments seem to assume. One peculiarity, to begin with, of the documents that I've just mentioned is that they both assume that the main task is to stimulate innovation in manufacturing industry. If one looks at um, David Willits's strategy, Everything in the document, with one exception, which is computer games, is concerned with innovation in the making of things, in manufacturing. And four out of the five key challenges to be met by all Europeans are, if you read the text of the documents, about seeking technological or manufacturing solutions to Europe's problems. Now this is 
surprising. The internationally accepted definition of innovation, the so-called Oslo Declaration, Oslo Manual, is, defines innovation much more broadly than in manufacturing industry. Um, as you can see, it includes products, both goods and services, and processes, and marketing methods, and organizational methods. Uh, so a much wider focus than on manufacturing as a whole. And the OECD, for example, believe that areas of the economy other than manufacturing have been major sources and continue to be major sources of innovation and drivers of economic growth. This is because um, economic growth over the past 150 years has seen a declining share of manufacturing and agriculture in the labor force and in the overall economy and a rise in the share of services. If one looks at three representative countries, you can see that in all these three different countries, services have become gradually, well not very gradually, quite rapidly, uh, much more important. And industry, in the sense of manufacturing industry, is now a tiny proportion of the economies of these three countries, only slightly over 20%, with agriculture um, uh, having virtually disappeared in these countries. So, both in terms of employment, which is what is here, and in terms of the actual value of output in the economy, our, our economies are essentially dominated by services, not by manufacturing. And that's true in every G7 country. If one looks at uh, these countries, the G7 countries, you can see that over the past um, 40 years, from 1970, every country, starting from different points and ending up at slightly different points, has had the same trajectory in which uh, manufacturing has become a smaller and smaller part of um, the economy. Now, the odd thing about this situation is that it's universally seen as a problem. Our politicians have long bemoaned the decline of manufacturing. They've seen it wrongly, as you can see. Sorry, let me put this back on my ear. Uh, they've seen it wrongly, as you can see, as peculiar to Britain. Now, in a time of financial crisis, one of the main objectives is to rebalance our economy and to do so by stimulating innovation in manufacturing. That's fine, but what is, I think, very odd is to ignore in the process the opportunities for growth and innovation in services. It's as if we want to seek the solution for society's problems in mechanical solutions. It's as if the only solution to crime is to devise a better burglar alarm or the solution to aging is to provide a better Zimmer frame, or the solution to security is to have better body scanners in aircraft, in, air, in airports. I think this is a, a very um, restricted view. Societal problems are much more likely to need societal solutions based on clear analysis of those problems by social scientists. Who can really say, faced with, for example, the costs of rail and road construction, traffic congestion, the noise and air pollution around airports, the rising price of oil, who seriously believes that the solution to transport problems lies only in building better cars or trains or aircraft? We need to change uh, our approach to many of these problems rather than to focus on these narrow mechanical solutions. Now why, why is there this uh, attitude? Why in economies which have been dominated by service industries for 
for 30, 40, in some cases in this country, over 100 years, do politicians yearn for the golden age of the Industrial Revolution? Why has the rural idyll, which was beloved of the 19th century, been replaced by a similar romanticization of the cotton mill or the factory or the brickyard? I think there are two principal reasons for this. The first is an ideology and the second is a problem of measurement. First, the ideology. It's composed of a number of interlinked beliefs. The first is a mistaken theory of value. Um, Keynes, of course, said that politicians were enthralled to long dead economists. I sometimes think that uh, politicians in this case, or many other people in this case, are enthralled to very long dead economists uh, in the sense of the, the physiocrats of the 18th century, of whom Kesney was a particular example, who saw all value as stemming from the land and viewed everything else as not producing value. This economic theory soon uh, was confronted with the reality of the Industrial Revolution, became less um, obviously acceptable. And then there have been a series of other uh, theories of value, of which the, the labor theory of value is probably the most well known, um, although that, as you can see from this quotation, also has its problems. But actually, we don't use any of these theories of value today. Today, all market activities, services, agriculture, manufacturing, are counted as part of gross domestic product. But somehow, physiocracy lives on in the view that value or wealth is created only by the making, growing, or mining of tangible objects. Politicians consider that manufacturing is, quote, wealth creating, while all other economic activities particularly if they happen to be in the public sector, are non-productive, wealth-consuming, and therefore parasitic or inferior. And this view is remarkably widespread. I can remember arguing with, in the 1990s with an, two people, the president of the Royal Society at the time and a Labour MP from a northern industrial area. I had suggested that the service sector also creates value, and they found that incomprehensible and offensive. So that's the first view that underpins this deification of manufacturing in our societies. The second linked belief is held by many natural scientists and engineers. It's the so-called linear model, which states that investment in fundamental research will lead to applied research, which will lead to invention, which will lead to innovation of new products and to economic growth. The best way to stimulate growth, therefore, is to spend more money on fundamental research and on training more natural scientists and engineers. And this is why, very important politically, this is why science, technology, and medicine, the so-called STEM subjects, are protected in higher education funding and in schools. The third belief that I think is, is involved here is simple industrial romanticism. It echoes, in a sense, the awe and wonder with which the romantic poets greeted the Industrial Revolution. Making things is exciting, while teaching, caring, or serving isn't. As the design correspondent of The Guardian recently put it, a consumer or service economy will never make us happy. It's time to rescue ourselves economically and in terms of well-being through more of us making intelligent, useful, and profitable things contentedly and well. He did that, as you can see, in an article entitled The German Way, ignoring entirely the fact that Germany has also experienced the, uh, virtually the same trajectory of the decline of manufacturing and the rise of the service sector. So you've got the ideology of economic value, you've got the linear model of innovation, and you've got romanticism. And together, this is a very strong set of beliefs. 
It sees the entire course of economic change in all developed countries over the past two centuries as basically a mistake. It's a mistake that must be reversed by governmental action to stimulate manufacturing and science and engineering at the expense of other sectors. If such policies have failed as they manifestly have over the past 50 years, this is merely a reason for spending even more money. So you've got an ideology, but you've also got, and here one begins to look at the difficulties of measurement. You've got a problem of measurement. As I said earlier, for all practical and policy purposes, since the Second World War, we've measured our economies within the framework of national income analysis. And it leads to the familiar calculations of national product, GDP or gross national product, or its equivalent, ought to be its equivalent if it's measured properly, national income. And in essence, this framework is based on measuring everything that's bought and sold in the economy and all the incomes that are paid to workers, capitalists, and rentiers. And it's these calculations that lead to judgments about whether we're in a state of growth or recession. For example, last month, the calculation that Britain is once again in recession because of two successive quarters, quarterly falls of GDP. Now, there are anomalies in this system, although it is the way in which we organize our entire uh, systems of national accounting. It does account only for economic activity which is monetized. I lectured last year on gardening. Um, and gardening and the product of gardening doesn't appear in most cases in GDP because it's not uh, the subject of monetary transactions. I quoted then a distinguished economist, uh, Jevons, who once put it that if he were to marry his housekeeper, we're talking about the 1930s, and thus stop paying her, uh, national income would fall. So there are difficulties about the concepts of national income, but they are the way in which we um, measure our whole uh, economic life. But there is a particular problem about measuring the output and hence the productivity of services in general and of those in the public sector in particular. Because it's very difficult to measure the, what is the output of um, a public service or a service generally, um, it was often assumed in the absence of better information that you could approximate the output of a service by the payments to the inputs, principally labor. In fact, in many cases, entirely labor. So the output of teachers was assumed to be, in value terms, the same as their wages. The problem about this is, is that it, it implies that it's impossible for teachers or doctors or care assistants or everybody else engaged in the 75% of the economy which this covers to become more efficient because by assumption you're assuming they can't or to, be, to improve the quality of what they do. It's particularly difficult, I will admit, to measure changes in the quality of services and this is of great importance, for example, in the health service. How do we measure changes in the quality of service in the health, in the health service? It was even argued for some time by some economists that it's impossible to envisage improvements in the quality of many services. How could you improve on the performance of a Beethoven string quartet? The answer is, well, maybe you could, um, but anyway, you could certainly improve on it by recording technology which made the particular Beethoven performance of a Beethoven string quartet much more accessible to much more people. But this difficulty in measuring the output and the inputs of the service sector has made the service sector and the public sector in particular to take a caricature of public servants, an easy target for politicians who argue that services, and particularly non-market services, are obviously and inherently inefficient 
compared to manufacturing on the one hand or the private sector on the other. There are other difficulties about measurement which I won't go into in any detail. For example, that for a long period, the national accounts didn't include, uh, didn't classify investment in intangible assets such as computer software or the internet as the equivalent of investment in machines so that it greatly underestimated the, um, uh, the, the extent of investment in uh, increased, in effi increased efficiency in large sectors of the economy. Indeed, the rise of services as a proportion of national product, the, the um, graph that I showed you earlier, was sometimes attributed not to their efficiency, not to the fact they were doing their job better, but to the reverse, to the allegation that they couldn't increase their efficiency as rapidly as manufacturing and therefore became uh, more important, particularly in terms of the labor force. Now, all these things that I've been talking about are, have been pretty well known to economists and economic historians for some time. And many of the conventions of national income accounting have been changed. The OECD, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts have all recently improved their output, their, their estimates of output and investment in services. And within my own discipline, economic historians have rewritten the history of the service sector and emphasized that it's become increasingly profitable, increasingly efficient during the 20th century. So the central message is that so even if services were once a drag on the economy, if one thinks in terms of services like domestic service, for example, probably they were, but they no longer are. And we should stop thinking that they are. But even if social scientists now realize that services are central to our economy and to raising productivity, no one else, nobody else seems to. Politicians, as I say, want to rebalance the economy. Investment in research is heavily skewed towards medicine, the physical sciences, and engineering. If one takes, for example, the um, grants given by the, the European Research Council, um, by decision, not, not because of peer review processes or, or um, judgments of, of the actual quality of the science involved, about 11% of the total expenditure goes on the social sciences and the humanities, uh, the rest on natural sciences and engineering. And as I said earlier on, the uh, European, the, the new framework program, Horizon 2020, and the British uh, research policy has the same uh, bias. This is very odd. I mean, we're talking about societal problems, but we're uh, starving the social sciences of the funds which they would need to uh, analyze and uh, contribute to the solution of those problems. And I think this matters. It matters certainly to me as a social scientist, but I think it should matter to us as citizens of Britain and of Europe. But I do think, to go back to the point, that it's, it's a bit difficult to understand why it's happened. One of the reasons, however, why I think it's happened is, apart from the ones I gave earlier, is that actually we don't know enough about innovation. We don't know enough about innovation in general, and we don't know enough about innovation in social sciences and the services in particular. So that our concepts of innovation in the caring professions or in, um, in teaching, for example, are uh, badly um, articulated, badly defined. There have been a number of economists, um, these two in particular, who have studied the topic of innovation and indeed have contributed to what is now increasingly being called the, the subject of innovation science. 
But as these quotes suggest, is that we don't really understand innovation in manufacturing. Um, in services, we've hardly begun. So it occurred to me that one way we might um, approach this topic is to start to think about innovation in a service that is, to me, close to home, which is the social sciences themselves. Perhaps if we can explain innovation in the social sciences, we can gain some insight into innovation in service industries more generally. We, in education, are part of the knowledge economy. We're part of the service sector. We're part of the public sector. But also, actually, we sell what we produce. So it may be worth looking at the nature of innovation in the services um, by measuring the service that I and my colleagues provide, I think, to society. As I said earlier, one of the difficulties is how do you measure the output of a service? What, um, so what is the output of a social science such as economic history? What is it that we do? Well, I think like every other uh, discipline, research and teaching discipline in the universities, we create and transmit knowledge. We do that by teaching, research, and publication. Our output is our students, our books, our articles, and the impact, a word that's become a dirty word in some areas of higher education, but I think is, is an extremely important word, the impact that all these things have on others and on the wider world, on others in, in the, the, the disciplines concerned and in the wider world. Measuring our output of students is very difficult. It's particularly difficult in economic history because it spans two disciplines of economics and history and very difficult to classify. But it's particularly difficult, in fact, because uh, certainly the production of students ought to be, and I think usually is, a joint product. It's the result of interactions between teachers and the taught, or teachers and learners. Um, and attributing a particular uh, benefit or a particular output to the teachers is a very difficult thing indeed to do. So most universities, most um, uh, academics fall back on measuring, trying to measure their research. In fact, they tend to fall back on research full stop. Um, so what has been the amount of research in British economic history, in economic history generally? Unusually, um, we can actually measure output of research in British economic history since 1925. That's because um, the Economic History Review, the trade journal of economic history, has published lists of books and articles in British economic history since it was uh, established in 1925 at the beginning of the profession. It began very small, inevitably, but by 2010, annual output of books and articles in economic history, on British economic history, let alone the rest of the world, was averaging 2,000 books and articles a year. That's trivial by the standards of chemistry or physics or most of the biological sciences, but um, it may still be interesting to look at, at uh, how, it was, how it has occurred. One of the things that is quite clear is that it's occurred as a result of very, very substantial increases in productivity. If one tries to measure the number of people involved in this uh, process and divide that into the number of publications, you find that since 1925, British economic history has uh, increased its productivity by seven times. And at the same time, there are market tests of the improvement in uh, our productivity. For example, books sold by the, the major publisher in the field, Cambridge University Press, which, as you can see, shows even 
uh, over the last five years, a very significant increase in the uh, sales of the subject. So I'm going to assert that these statistics, and there are others, but suggest that there's been a really substantial increase in productivity, that the idea that you can't have an increase in productivity in a service industry like teaching and research is clearly incorrect. But of course, to say that there has been an increase in productivity doesn't tell you where it's come from. Has it come from outside or from changes in the way that we work, or has it come from something you might call innovation? Now, there clearly is one sig significant uh, factor behind this growth, and that is the thing that's affected all of us, the IT revolution. The computer is now part of all our personal and academic lives, and it's part of the social sciences as much as in other disciplines. But one sometimes forgets how recent this change has been. In the early 1960s, the process of calculation had hardly changed since the days of Newton, or at least since the invention of logarithms. Mechanical calculators became available in the 1950s, but complex calculations were nearly impossible. A basic tool of, of social science, and most of the social sciences, is so-called regression analysis, uh, a means of, of exploring the um, causal relationships within um, complex phenomena. You could spend an entire summer in the 1950s doing a regression analysis with three independent variables, which would now take, once you put the data in, uh, milliseconds to produce on a computer. Now, the reason why this is important, or why the um, IT revolution is important in social sciences is because I would assert that the social sciences, including economic history, were early and enthusiastic adopters of the new technology. They realized very quickly the benefits that processing large volumes of data, uh, statistical analysis of large volumes of data, and of course word processing, presentational software, this kind, uh, would the benefits that this could achieve. Um, and economic historians were, I think, at the forefront of, the, of seeing these possibilities and of uh, grasping the possibilities. I remember in the mid-1960s using the main Oxford University computer, the KDF-9, which you see at the bottom right here. That computer cost well over a million pounds in the prices of the day, perhaps over 40 million pounds in today's prices. It's quite extraordinary, looking back on it, that I was actually allowed, as a graduate student, to operate this machine in the middle of the night in order to get uh, some results. But just one illustration is that its memory was one-tenth of that of this iPhone. As a result, you had to use complex, uh, well, not complex, um, rather simple, but rather um, difficult um, methods of data storage on punch cards or paper tape of the kind that you see here. We then move over the, the course of the next decades from through data terminals, through laptops, through um, uh, to the iPhone uh, that I've referred to and advertised a few moments ago. And the result is that the cost of data collection, to take one example, has fallen to a tenth or less of the costs in the 1990s. And together we've got the benefits of improved software uh, to do things now, which now we can now use software to do things that in the, the 1960s were really difficult things to do, like sorting alphabetically. I had to write my own routines to sort alphabetically, because there, there were no package programs to do that. So the social sciences participated in this IT revolution, which I've just sketched in these last two slides. We did, I think, affect its development, actually, uh, in many ways, but we were my, mainly recipients of an exogenous technological change, which has been transformative. I wouldn't dispute that in the slightest. It's been, has an amazing effect on, on the disciplines, uh, on almost every academic discipline. 
But I think it's unlikely that it accounts for all of the productivity increase, all that sevenfold increase that I referred to earlier. Part of it is maybe because academics may be working harder. I think most of us feel that we are. Uh, but probably some of it is due to different methods, to innovation. So I want to look at how innovation occurs in a subject like economic history and in the other social sciences and see if we can learn some lessons from it. What is innovation in an academic discipline? Here are three possible um, definitions of it. The first of them, by a social psychologist, is, I think, much too general. He essentially defines um, anything that produces value as being an innovation or creative. Um, Arthur Kersler, at the bottom, uh, essentially sees innovation as the product of interdisciplinary activity. Um, and I think that, again, is a bit too restrictive. Interdisciplinary activity is I think, uh, important, but not the be-all and end-all. So I go back to the Oslo definition, which I quoted earlier, uh, and see, try to see how that can be applied in, in uh, a social science discipline. Um, how do we... I'm going to concentrate, in fact, on three major innovations that have taken place in the subject over the past uh, 30, 40 years. The first is national income history, Second is demographic history, and the third is the so-called anthropometric history. So what were these innovations? National income history first was the application to history of the framework of national accounts, which I referred to earlier. Those, that framework had been created principally by an American economist and economic historian, Simon Kuznets. But during the 1950s and 1960s, a team of economists calculated the components and totals of national income right back to the 18th century initially, but then back, as you can see here, to uh, 1600. And the importance of this is that it provided an overall framework for the study of the economy, a framework into which all the detailed complexities must fit. That's the beauty of national income analysis. It's comprehensive well, mainly comprehensive, pretty comprehensive, um, and uh, therefore you can look at it consistently. The second innovation which occurred in this period is the uh, work on the history of the British population. And I think this rivals national income analysis in our impact on understanding our societies. Malthus, of course, at the end of the 18th century, had emphasized there was a close connection between population change and the economy, but it wasn't until we were able actually to measure the uh, growth of the population in this country that we could fit population change into the history of economic growth. And this was done by something called the Cambridge Group for the History of Population and Social Structure, aided by a huge army of local volunteers transcribing parish registers. Estimates were made not just for aggregate population change, but also for um, its components, and in the process, uh, emphasizing something which uh, had not previously been believed, that the primary determinant of population growth in the um, 18th century um, was the growth of the birth rate here, not uh, fluctuations in the death rates. The third example of innovation is anthropometric history, which uh, I've been concerned with for uh, some 20 or 30 years. National accounts count only what's monetized, but studies and changes of st changing living standards were similarly based before the last 20 or 30 years on money. We've changed that to base them on how tall people are, on the, their heights and other bodily characteristics. It hasn't replaced monetary um, measures of the changes in the standard of living, but it's a very important complementary measure to use. Now, and it produces graphs of this kind, which show, for example, that during the 
19, during the um, middle of the 19th century, there was a period of the growth of the cities when average height of the population, a very good measure of the standard of living, was actually falling. Now, I would assert that as a result of these three innovations in the subject, we now understand the history of the British economy in an entirely different way. They're not the only innovations in the subject. There are three or four others that I could mention, but their impact has been enormous. So it's possible for an academic discipline, a service industry, to go back to my original point, to be transformed by innovation as well as by technology. Now, what explains why has this happened? What lessons can we learn from them? And I've been talking to my peers and, and colleagues in the subject, um, interviewing them, um, reading their thoughts. And I would argue that innovation involves, in a subject like mine, and I think in much, many scientific disciplines, really five things. Teamwork, leadership, argument, money, and luck. First, teamwork. The popular conception of the inventor, of the innovator, is, of course, of the, you know, the lone individual struggling against all odds to produce some new uh, piece of output. But social psychologists who've studied innovation and creativity agree very much. They don't agree on many things, but they do agree on one maxim, which is that two heads are better than one. Most advances have come from teams. This was the team that produced national income analysis. This was the team that produced anthropometric history. Um, and you can see that, um, in the words of Brodel, it's a team which brings together people from different disciplines. The original idea of measuring health by the use of height data came from a demographer, population scientist. But it required the combined skills of historians, economists, statisticians, human biologists to realize the potential and to grapple with the difficulties. So I think teamwork is essential in interdisciplinary work. It's extremely difficult for one person or even a, a team of the kind that we have here, my friends and colleagues, um, to master the breadth of relevant literature and to understand the assumptions that are made by people in cognate disciplines or often uh, somewhat uh, different disciplines. I often recall the words of my own supervisor, um, H.A. Habakkuk, which was one man cannot think in two ways. But I think it's the team that makes that possible, makes it possible for the collectivity to think in more than one way. And that that is extremely important in terms of innovation. Secondly, leadership. Leadership is particularly important in demographic history, and this is um, the two leaders of the field, one of whom will be very familiar to anybody who knows, for example, about the history of U3A and the Open University, Peter Laslett, uh, on the top left here. But his risk-taking and leadership in uh, population history was of enormous importance. And it becomes important particularly, and this was true in anthropometric history as well, um, when money becomes more and more important, as data sets get bigger and research teams become larger. The, the leader of the anthropometric group, Bob Fogel, on the top left hand here, who was one of the two people, has been one of the two economic historians to win the Nobel Prize, uh, tells me that he spends half his time raising funds for um, these activities. But I think probably even more important than a genius for writing research proposals is a genius for gathering together people who can work together. So teamwork and leadership. But also argument is terribly important. Innovation brings and stems from controversy. Schumpeter, one of the great theorists of innovation, spoke of creative destruction. An innovation implies the overturning of an old paradigm, which is often, if not always, resisted. All these 
the three innovations were uh, controversial. Um, international income analysis, probably the least controversial. But once one got on to the whole concept of quantification in economic history, which underpins many of these things, that became itself controversial. And that parallels uh, controversies in the other social sciences concerned with the so-called quantitative turn, the movement towards the increasing use of statistics and theoretical analysis in these disciplines. And there was a great deal of argument. We had, on the one hand, the, the old guard, so to speak, although they didn't like being called that, of course, um, arguing against dehumanizing methods. We had the new guard um, arguing for uh, the importance of statistics and econometrics. And many of the um, in innovations that I'm talking about, and this is where argument and the ability to argue becomes important, were met with incredulity, if not derision. Uh, certainly that was true of uh, anthropometric history. The idea that measuring people's heights could tell you anything about of any interest uh, was derided. I was told by economists that it could tell us nothing because living standards were defined solely by real wages. Historians, on the other hand, said that any change or difference in heights was obviously genetic. Um, a hundred years of debate about nature and nurture had essentially passed them by. Um, but so a thick skin is the, the accompaniment to the need for argument. The fourth so source of innovation is money. It's a myth, one in which social scientists and I think humanities scholars have been complicit that research in our disciplines is cheap. You hear academics saying, all I need is time. They forget that they also probably need a salary, a room, a 500-year-old library in which to work and access to the internet, of course. And all the innovations that I've talked about have been expensive. They've required long-term investment and support from research councils and universities, from the, the bodies whose logos are up here, the research councils in particular, and it required, and I think one should give them credit for this, they're usually attacked for lack of uh, imagination. In fact, it required imagination and faith to invest as heavily as they did in both the UK and the US in groups of young scholars without track records uh, exploring new and uh, controversial uh, um, subjects. Fifth and finally, luck. Bob Fogel, who I mentioned earlier, one of our Nobel Prize winners, says you've got to be lucky. Luck is often crucial in framing questions and in finding data, particularly importance in historians. But much more generally, I think Isaac Asimov's words here are absolutely crucial. The important words in science are not eureka, but that's funny. It's the mold on a culture, to use another analogy, that changes the face of science. And in history, the chances of data discovery often uh, are concerned with luck. There are many examples in which um, innovation stems from people thinking, that doesn't look quite right. i work it out again. Nobody, incidentally, in all the interviews that I've done, has mentioned anything that could be described as a eureka moment. I have been told, and I certainly remember myself, several moments which I would describe as how could I have been so stupid moments, <laughs> usually about mistakes in collecting data or encoding or analyzing data. So innovation, I would say, proceeds by the slow accretion of knowledge and by little movements, uh, little insights, perhaps, as a result of, of luck. And that's funny. And also it proceeds, and I think this is important to recognize in universities, by others, by colleagues, by chance remarks over coffee. It's, it's very interesting in, in uh, discussing their work with a leading people in my subject, how often they attribute a particular research direction 
not to their own ideas, but to a remark by somebody else. So teamwork, leadership, controversy, money, and luck seem to be, together with peer support and the role of others, seem to be the main drivers of innovation. And I think the main things that have produced the innovation that um, I've described. Together, they've been able just to take advantage of technological change, uh, but the technological change has not been the be-all and end-all. I think what has been the be-all and end-all is the, the ideas. So what conclusions can we draw from about all this for innovation generally, for the future of the social sciences, and for public policy? The first is that innovation is a very complicated process. It's not simple. You cannot simply inject a pile of money into a laboratory and expect five or six years later economic growth to result. It is much more complicated than that. And I think sometimes uh, university people, academics in pleading for more money for research uh, are prone to oversimplify and oversell the benefits of potential benefits of investment. It is a very chancy process. But I think there are other conclusions that I would draw. Going back to the beginning, I think we, if you're going to devise innovation policy, you have to deal with the economy as it is, not as you would like it to have been. You shouldn't hark back to some golden age of happy mechanics. Um, laughing happily as they made things. That is not what our society is about now. Our society is about caring, teaching, learning, uh, serving, not about making things. And if one's to devise innovation policies, you have to recognize that. Secondly, you have to recognize that those services and indeed the social sciences that analyze those services can innovate. They can raise their productivity. They're not backwaters in which lone scholars haunt, uh, skulk in libraries. They have a great deal to contribute to solving problems which are not simply mechanical. They're not simply the preserve of manufacturing or the physical and engineering sciences. Let me return for one second to Horizon 2020. All these challenges, which the EC has identified, are about society. They're not, they may have, of course, technological uh, aspects to them, but they're about principally how we organize our societies. They're about politics, they're about economics, they're about behavior. You hear a great deal from politicians now about nudging, behavior change. It's quite clear that in order to contribute to the solution of these problems, we will have to change our behaviors. We will have to insulate our homes to deal with the energy problem. We will have to um, uh, change our, our attitudes in a whole range of ways to solve these problems there, and it's not necessarily, of course there are technological solutions to many of the problems, but um, the analysis that comes from the social sciences uh, and from the humanities, uh, understanding our behavior is an essential prerequisite to changing our behavior. That follow, what follows from that is that the social sciences can and I believe must demand a fair share of the research funds devoted to these challenges. The social sciences are at the forefront of the analysis of large data sets. Of course, the Genome Project and the um, many projects in, in uh, the physical and natural sciences uh, have the characteristic that increasingly they rely on huge scale data processing, but so too do uh, changes in the social sciences, do improvements in the social sciences, and those will become and are becoming more costly and require to be funded. 
I think the, my general point is, in a, as I go back to it, innovation is not a simple process. We need to understand it better if we are to devise policies to uh, promote it. We must study the economy as it is, the media and creative industries, the services and professions, health and welfare, as intensively as in the past we studied machine tools, mines or railways. And I think social scientists have a responsibility to make these points, uh, not to withdraw into their silos, and, but to go out and say, we have a contribution to make to understanding our society. We want to make that contribution, but politicians must enable us to do it. Public engagement, as I'm sure Sir Thomas Gresham believed, although he didn't quite put it this way, is the only way to combat the ignorance which I think is all too prevalent. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions for five minutes or so before I need a drink as much as you do. <laughs> yes. One of the basic problems of the social sciences is that to non-specialists, the, the findings or arguments they put forward are either seen as trivial mm. or um, don't make any sense. Now, one of, the, one of the things that you pointed out in your slide, in your lecture, was that teamwork and other factors, related factors, mm. are, are, are hardly distinct from what Schumpeter would have argued in relation to innovation. That the key aspect you drew out of teamwork is actually something that Adam Smith talked about and Schumpeter, ha Schumpeter highlighted, mm. which was the division of labour and specialisation yeah. mm. and the importance mm. of organising specialisation in, mm. in, in knowledge creation. Mm. So what, what, one of the problems you've got in terms of arguing for more funding from policy makers is, is how you communicate the significance mm. of your findings in research. Yeah. But going beyond that, what, one of the things your talk didn't draw out, for me, who's not an economic historian, is what makes an economic, economic historian distinctive from other casts of mind, other ways of thinking. And that, that, what, you, what you pulled out, uh, uh, many other disciplines could have pulled out, you know, said teamwork, argument, you know, that, that's not distinctive to an economic historian. That's no. common to many fields of endeavour. Well, partly I was indeed using ec uh, economic history as an example which I think is, is a good example of the social sciences in general. So I wouldn't really dissent from your view that economic historians aren't particularly different. I do think they're different in one major respect, which is that they do believe that history is important. Whereas um, I think that it's a, a gen generalization, but not a wild generalization, um, for whatever kinds of reasons, most of the other social sciences are essentially ahistorical. Uh, or if they do uh, consider history, they consider very, very recent history. Um, I mean, uh, one can multiply examples of this, but it's perhaps most obvious in, in uh, economics, where um, the uh, study, for example, of the Great Depression of the 1930s was hardly, hardly existed in British economics departments. Um, so I think that the sense of the past, which comes from history and from uh, economic history, I think is an extremely important distinguishing characteristic. Of course, other disciplines bring other important characteristics, so I'm not going to argue that that's the be-all and end-all. Going back to your first point, which is about why social science um, seems to, uh, well, it seems either to be trivial and obvious or wrong. Um, I think the answer is that, um, particularly in contradistinction to many of the natural and, and physical sciences where most politicians haven't got a clue what is going on, because a, an absolutely dreadfully small proportion of them have ever had any scientific training at all, they do believe that they can generalize and talk about the findings of, uh, in sociology or economics or um, 
even such topics as well, anthropology and family structures and so on, uh, they're almost equally ignorant, in fact, in many cases of the research findings in those fields, but it doesn't stop them talking about them. So I think there is a problem there, um, and that is one of the reasons why the, um, associated, uh, the, the Academy of the Social Sciences has a um, campaign for the social sciences, one of whose objectives is to uh, appoint, is to get appointed a government chief social scientist. We have government chief government scientists, and in many departments there are uh, natural and physical scientists in, as chief scientists in those departments. We don't have any social scientists. And yet, as you can see from these, you know, how are you going to look at topics of health and aging and demographic change and so on without understanding the um, characteristics of those systems uh, which underlie those. So I think, I do believe very strongly that um, in evidence-based policy making, um, I'm told that there is, there is literally one government department that has recently set up a unit for policy-based evidence. And I think that illustrates in a sense what the problem is, that politicians want the evidence to support the policies that they've thought of. Um, and social scientists, on the other hand, tend to be a bit awkward and say, actually, you don't understand this. Thank you. A fascinating lecture. I've been involved with uh, trying to protect innovation most of my life as a patent attorney. My conclusion is your crucial term was, that's funny. Yeah. Because most great inventions have arisen almost by chance. Mm. Somebody has had the time and the support, not great support generally, but small support, to have the time to look and say, that's a bit odd. Mm. We ought to look at it a bit more. Yeah. And I think politicians, this is anathema to a politician. They want to be out of control. They say, we can pay money and something will happen. Mm. That's a conclusion, it's not a question. I'm happy for you to shoot it down. Thank you very much. I do agree with you. And I think the problem is that we're now talking about very, very large sums of money. Um, and that, uh, you know, if you're going to say to European citizens that they are going to devote 80 billion euros over the course of six years to um, promoting innovation, you should pause a bit and say, well, you know, what's that 80 billion going to buy you? And what's the best way of investing it? Um, and uh, that's really, I suppose, one of the messages I would give. Yes, Dan. I would like to ask a question about the quality of innovation. Mm. Uh, I recognize that more and more research is being done Mm. but I question the quality of a lot of this research. Mm. Uh, Forty years ago, I was present during a very interesting conversation with a distinguished economic historian at the London School of Economics. And he said, if he was writing an economic history of the period 1750 to 1850, it would be very different from the history of the Industrial Revolution that he had actually written. Mm. We then went on to speculate what the differences would be and the general consensus was that at least half the book should be devoted to London and that within that half, two or three chapters should be devoted to the East India Company. Mm. Uh, I have been waiting during for the last 40 years for such a book to appear uh, and when I have looked at mm. what purport to be economic histories of the period, the East India Company is usually mentioned only in passing on two or three occasions. Mm. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm glad that I can be slightly more optimistic. I mean, the innovation that I didn't, an innovation that I didn't talk about, but has been extremely important in recent social and economic history, although admittedly only in the last 10 years or so, is the whole attention to globalization. It is to move away from this concentration, which I confess to being a 
part of on Britain and to look at Britain in the wider world and indeed to look at Britain as rather a small part of that wider world and to look at the, the world as it is. Um, so I think there, ha there have been um, a great deal of work devoted to um, thinking about global trends in economic history and to collecting the data, which of course is, is often quite difficult to enable that to be possible. In terms of going back to the question of quality, I agree. I mean, I dodged it, didn't I? Um, I mean, I said that it's very difficult to measure quality in, um, in the service industries, and I think that is true. Um, all that one can really do is to make one's own judgments about quality. We, we, we see that there has been an enormous increase in publication um, and uh, um, you know, sometimes argue that this is, is more means worse. It's been a, you know, the standards have slipped and therefore you can get things published which you wouldn't have got published 30 or 40, 50 years ago. It's not my judgment that I actually, for this purpose, read quite a lot of things over long periods of social and economic history, and I think actually that partly because of the demands of modern data processing and modern statistical analysis, the quality is actually higher than it used to be. There are far fewer sloppy statements. There are, people have to document their conclusions much more much more sensibly. There is also there's an interesting market test in all this, which um, I don't think has, has been uh, looked at sufficiently in other disciplines. Um, it's often thought that, that the uh, demands of, of research and careers in economic history, in uh, academia, mean that more and more uh, rather dodgy periodicals are developed. Um, and that therefore it's easy to get things published in, you know, the Ukrainian Journal of Neuroscience or something. Um, I mean, which I'm sure doesn't exist. The, um, um, the, uh, but one of the interesting things about these 2,000 publications is that about half of them are books. They're not articles. Somebody is buying these things. And in terms of economic value, to go back to that point, that means somebody values them, and that's a good judge of justification of quality. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.